I uh, thank the gentleman uh, for yielding. I rise in support of this rule, although I have a lot of complaints about how we deal with the issue of war. This is a debate that should have gone on four months ago before the war was started, and if we'd have done this properly, uh, we wouldn't be bringing this up quickly. Uh, no committee work, no discussion, no chance for amendment. But nevertheless, I will support the rule because at least we get a chance to talk a little bit about what's going on in, in Libya. We have two resolutions that will come up under this rule. The first resolution, generally I understand most individuals aren't too keen on this because it's a literal endorsement. It's a rather explicit endorsement of the war, and I obviously would be opposed to H.J. Res. 68. But my greatest concern is about H.R. 2278, because the way I read this uh, resolution is that it essentially grants the same authority that we grant in the first one, because we say that oh no, no funds can be used, deny the use of funds, but how can you deny the use of appropriated funds when they're using funds that weren't appropriated? It's so redundant. The funds were never appropriated, so yes, it's a good statement. No funds, you don't continue to be illegal, is what we're saying. But what I'm concerned about are the exceptions. All the exceptions or for the things that they're doing. You know, like search and rescue, intelligence gathering, renaissance, uh, surveillance, refueling, uh, uh, operations planning, and uh, doing everything except pulling the trigger. So we're legalizing that. I believe that H.R. 2278 is the first time that we in the Congress are making a statement that we are granting authority to the President to pursue this particular war. So I am in strong opposition to that resolution as well, although I understand the other side of the argument because it says denial of funds. But, you know, the, the resolution actually says that, uh, you know, the main reason, the author of the resolution said, the reason why we have the exception is to protect the integrity of our contract or agreement with NATO. Well, in the resolution, the new resolution said we have to stop the funding because we don't want to support NATO's war. So it's totally inconsistent, it makes no sense whatsoever, but it reminds me of the War Powers Resolution. You know, after, after the Vietnam War, we didn't want to get into that, that kind of war anymore, so they come along to Congress, and it is an infinite wisdom is with great good intentions, designs the War Power Resolution, which legalized war for 90 days. That's part of the reason why we're here. We're worrying about it 90 days, but here we're going into the fourth month dealing with the War Powers Resolution. There's a simple solution to all of this. And that is, obey the Constitution, don't allow our presidents to go to war without a declaration of war, and we wouldn't be facing this problem of this debate that actually gets a little bit silly. Uh, on, on restraining the president. Yes, we should. We should exert ourselves. We have the prerogatives. We have the obligations. Time has and we have avoided it. It's time to stand up for the rule of law. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. I thank the, <clears throat> I thank the gentlelady for yielding, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to the uh, uh, Hastings uh, resolution and in support of the Rooney resolution. This morning's uh, paper, New York Times, says that this is a dangerous resolution because it would allow financing only for American surveillance, search and rescue missions, planning and aerial refueling, and would halt drone strikes and attacks on Libyan air defenses. It would damage the nation's credibility and its leadership of NATO. Mr. Speaker, I think that the nation's credibility, that is to say its promise to go to war if backed by the President, not by Congress, ought to be damaged. We have been sliding for 70 years to a situation where Congress has nothing to do with the decision about whether to go to war or not, and the President is becoming an absolute monarch. In this situation, and we must put a stop to that right now, if we don't want to become an empire instead of a republic. This country was set up to be a republic where the basic questions of war and peace were supposed to be by this Congress. Because of the exigencies of the Cold War, if the bombers are coming over the pole, you don't have time to call Congress, we lost a lot of that power. We ceded it to the President. But in a situation such as Libya, whether the reasons for going there are good or ill, the fact is there was no imminent threat to the United States. The Secretary of Defense said that. There was plenty of time to negotiate with the Arab League, plenty of time to go to the UN. 
There should have been time to get not Congress, congr not consultations with Congress, but, but an authorization from Congress. In the absence of that authorization, we have to put our foot down now and say no. And if co foreign countries learn that they cannot depend on American military intervention unless Congress is aboard for the ride, good. That's a good thing. The power of the presidency, and I'm not talking about this president. As was said by Charles James Fox in 1780, the power of the crown, in this case the power of the president, has increased, is increasing, and ought to be diminished. This country's power to go to war or not must reside here, except in extreme and urgent emergencies. Time it's time expired. to put our foot down now by passing that resolution. The I thank time you. Has expired. Back. Gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, at this time I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from, gentlewoman from North Carolina, uh, Ms. Fox. The gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague from Georgia for yielding time. I rise today in support of this rule and of H.R. 2278, a bill to prohibit funds for continued U.S. military involvement in Libya, except for operations involving search and rescue, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, aerial refueling, and operational planning. In 2007, then the junior senator from Illinois, Barack Obama, confidently proclaimed to the Boston Globe this comment, quote, the president does not have power under the Constitution to unilaterally authorize a military attack in a situation that does not involve stopping an act, an actual or imminent threat to the nation, end quote. However, now that he is not attacking political opponents, that, that stance has proven inconvenient, prompting one of his many, many flip-flops, such as his, his vote opposing to raise the debt limit. Regardless of one's position on the constitutional powers of the president's commander-in-chief or Congress's authority to declare war, the legislative branch unquestionably yields the power of the purse. This bill represents a proper exercise of that power, pure and simple. The bill does not leave our military personnel in dangerous circumstances without the funds or supplies they need. It does not require precipitous withdrawal, since without a ground presence, there is nowhere from which to withdraw. The bill simply denies U.S. taxpayer funding for what the president calls a kinetic activity, but what, what the world recognizes as an ongoing bombing campaign in Libya. It is for these reasons and many more that I urge my colleagues to support the rule and to support H.R. 2278. I yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. Gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi. Gentleman is recognized for two minutes. I thank the lady from New York, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are later this morning going to be engaged in one of the most important tasks of Congress, and that is what to do about war. Uh, unfortunately, the administration, and I think they would agree to this, didn't adequately engage Congress in the process running up to the beginning of the Libya conflict and insufficient during the course of it. We are now in a position where we will be making some decisions today about how we want this nation to proceed, whether we want to proceed with a full-on war, a limited or a much more limited uh, activity with regard to the support of NATO in the Libya fight. Unfortunately, all of this is now being rushed upon us here in the last day just before the break for the 4th of July. The amount of time to debate this on the floor is far too limited. It would have been our preference on the Democratic side to have a more full discussion along the lines that the uh, gentle lady from New York discussed in her opening comments, a full-on discussion about how we are to proceed. We are basically going to have two options, both of them with inadequate discussion. I guess we're down to that point now where we have no more alternative but to use the one hour. So here we are debating this issue at this moment. For me, there's a very important principle that was enunciated by the United Nations, which is the obligation to defend and protect. And that was the basic rationale for this country moving forward uh, with the Libya operation. 
Yes, the President should have come to us early, should have come to us at the very beginning, and allowed Congress to carry out its constitutional obligations, yes or no. But here we are. The obligation or the right or the necessity to defend is very important. That's why we're there. We need to provide the President with the necessary powers to carry out that obligation in a very limited period of time. We'll see that this afternoon or later this morning with the Hastie's Amendment. I yield back my Gentleman's time. time has expired. Gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, I reserve my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to yield one minute to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Woolsey. Gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that the House has the opportunity today to have an, actually have an, a serious debate on the war with Libya. Like most Americans, I'm disappointed in any argument that says we are not at war. I believe that uh, argument shows contempt for the Constitution and for the executive's co-equal branch of government, the United States Congress. How can this not be war? If another country launched aggressive airstrikes against the United States, you better believe we'd consider it an act of war. Does anyone remember Pearl Harbor? 9-11? Uh, we certainly considered those acts of war against our country. To say that our bombing of Libya does not rise to the level of hostilities flies in the face of common sense. Mr. Speaker, our nation can't afford a third war. The ones we're already fighting are bankrupting us morally and fiscally. This Congress must reassert our power of the purse and not fund an unauthorized war. And today we must send a clear message. The American people and this Congress will not support perpetual war. Gentlelady's time has expired. Gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, at this time I'm pleased to yield uh, five minutes to the Chairman of the Rules Committee, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Without objection.